All right. Uh, the church of Ephesus had abandoned the love they had at first, but the church of Smyrna increased in love. Okay, so Ephesus is rebuked for not loving, but Smyrna is increasing in their love towards the Lord. We need to find out why this day. The church of Smyrna is undoubtedly and clearly a church. I'm not uh, trying to make something sound more pretty or interesting to you. I'm just telling you that the church of Smyrna, the people who made up this church, were willing, not only willing, but did die for their faith in Christ. Not theoretically, but actually. They gave their life because they were unwilling to recant, unwilling to deny singular faith in Christ. They were martyred. People were killed individually. We'll look at that in a moment. But they were unwilling to deny Christ. And I would say to you this morning that it is historically true that where the church is most persecuted, it is most pure. And where the church is most pampered and coddled, it is most corrupt. The church of Smyrna lived its early years in a time in which, get this, Christians were called atheists. The Christians were called atheists. Why? Because they didn't believe in all the pagan gods of the day. So all the pagans worshipped and sacrificed to these pagan gods, but the Christians had sole allegiance to the living God, so they considered them atheists. They didn't believe in the gods of the day. Christians refused to give honor to those things that were not God. Of course, the pagans, on the other hand, sacrificed and worshipped every deity they could find or invent. Thus, if you lived in Smyrna in the first century, it would actually be good if someone called you an atheist. You're one of those who doesn't believe in our gods. You just simply believe in some other god you've invented. So it would be good to be called an atheist in the day of Smyrna. That will be key later on in the message this morning. Maybe just a, a couple of things here. A persecution, I don't like it, you don't like it, if we ever actually experience it to any kind of level. Uh, it's not something that we necessarily want. However, in Eastern Europe, in Russia, China, countless other places where Christians are denied basic rights, listen, where they're denied basic rights, there exists a church of reigning power. You want to see a church that is powerful, that is pure, that is strong, that is zealous for God, most likely you'll find them, if you can say it this way, behind enemy lines, in a place where it's not legal to worship, in a, in a place where people actually suffer to some degree for their faith, there's where you find true, solid churches. You, you may remember in history when the Iron Curtain was torn down, and there was, in that time when the Iron Curtain was torn down, there was revealed a powerful and pure church which was characterized by genuine faith, deep spirituality, humility, zeal, love of the truth, and a single-minded devotion to the Lord. Churches like that exist in places you've never been to in China, in places that you've never been to in Afghanistan, to places that you wouldn't be willing to go in Mexico. There are groups and pockets of people that have put everything in in their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to find a church weak, muddled, arguing about vacuum cleaners or about this thing or that thing or the, the temperature on the thermostat? You find that junk in America. You want to find a church that is zealous for God? Look for a place where Christians are being persecuted. You just think for a moment how shallow we are in just here in Azel. Just think of how shallow the situation runs here. If a, if a church in our neighborhood was actually to call the Masonic Lodge a cult, they'd write it up in the papers and people would run out of that church like it was on fire. 
If, if somehow someone was actually brought up under discipline because they're living in open, known sin, and they're blaspheming the name of God all around the community, and they were disciplined, people would just run out of that church like crazy because what's wrong with those people? They have a standard. Just because discipline would be upheld, people would flee in the droves. Or just think, if you could find a church where they're trying to build a church that is God-centered instead of man-centered, just think of the controversy that would be caused in town. Just think of the people that would, what they would say and what they would do if a church actually committed to being God-centered rather than man-centered. Dude, that's not even a level of persecution in all reality. But we're so weak in America, if there's any confrontation of anything, well, I'm out of here. That's why Azel has 100-plus churches within a 15-mile radius because anywhere a standard is brought forth, well, I'll just go down the street where it's not so narrow or not so confrontational or not so afflicting upon my family because it's too hard if there's any kind of standard. Literally, we're that weak. I'm contrasting that attitude of Azel where we run off for anything to some church down the road. Contrast that with a member of a church of Smyrna. And here's a member at First Baptist Smyrna, and they say, if you don't deny Christ, we're going to tie you to this stake, and we're going to burn you to death. And they say, bring the wood, start the fire, I'm ready to go home. That's how it was in Smyrna. All right, let us look at Smyrna, and then we'll focus our attention upon one particular character in just a moment. Let me, I know some of this is historical and it's not my necessary expository verse-by-verse verse style, but I need to give you some description. Smyrna was perhaps settled as early as 3000 B.C., but about 600 B.C. it was destroyed completely by the Lydians. Alexander the Great's successor rebuilt the city in 290 B.C. That rebuilt city that Alexander's successor rebuilt that's who the letter is written to, to that rebuilt city uh, that John writes to at that, that time. It is a, this city was known for its extremely strong alliance to Rome. This city supported Rome with every ounce of energy it had. In 195 B.C., they built a temple in which Rome was worshipped. They actually had a temple people gathered in to worship Rome. It was so bad that when Rome was in war in the winter, their clothing was so bad and many of the soldiers were freezing that the citizens of Smyrna actually took off their clothes and sent them to the soldiers where the soldiers could stay warm while they were fighting. That's the type of allegiance that Smyrna had towards Rome. Well, because of that... Rome honored them by choosing Smyrna to build a temple to the emperor Tiberius in A.D. 26. Now we're moving close. Smyrna, dedication to Rome. Now we have this big temple built to emperor Tiberius, A.D. 26. Well, John's going to write this letter around the 90s. So within a 70-year period, you've got all this focus on Rome, all this worship of Rome, and in the midst of a pagan city, here comes this letter to a little small church isolated somewhere in this town where there's a group of believers that are gathering together who have their attention focused upon the Lord Jesus. Smyrna, by the way, is one of the most beautiful cities in Asia. Today it is Izmir, Turkey. You can look it up on Wikipedia or wherever you want to look it up at. You can see pictures of the city. It's, it's drop-dead gorgeous. I'd love to visit there someday. It is right there on the Aegean Sea. And today it is populated with probably three to four million people. But a beautiful city. Its most famous street is the Street of Gold. Now watch this. On one end, at one end of the Street of the Gold is the Temple of Cybele. At the other end of the temple, at the other end of the street, there's the Temple to Zeus. In between Zeus and Cybele, on different ends of the street of gold, in between them, you have temples for Apollo, Asclepius, and Aphrodite. So you've got all of these temples, all these pagan deities, and all this devotion to Rome, and they are committed that Caesar is Lord. You're getting a framework. 
That's the culture of the day in which Smyrna finds itself. So you have this little group of believers, four verses in the Word of God that shows us something about what's going on here. And you get a letter. God transmits the letter by the Holy Spirit to the Apostle John. The Apostle John writes the letter down. He writes this, and he sends this letter to Smyrna. So here you are in Smyrna, and you're at church on Sunday morning. Everything around you, you're here in secret in some location meeting together. Everything around you is against you. If you are found out, you are going to be killed. If you are found out, it is very likely that they'll take you to the theater, to the stadium. They'll release wild beasts and allow the wild beasts to eat you. And, and you will be devoured. Or they will burn you while the crowd jeers and marks, uh, remarks at you while you're being burnt at the stake. That's a very real possibility. That could happen to you today. That, that's what's going on in Smyrna. So notice how appropriate the letter is. Just... I'm not going to preach all these lines this morning. I just want you to notice the content of the letter. Notice who writes. The one who's the first, the one who's the last. Notice his description. I'm the one who died. I'm the one who's alive. Well, that's very appropriate, is it not? Death is impending. It's right very near. I could be put to death. The one speaking to me has already died, and yet he is alive. There's life after death. If I die today, I could have hope that I'll live tomorrow because the captain of my soul who wrote the letter has conquered death. Are you with me? I mean, this letter makes sense. The one I worship died, but he's alive. So if that's true of him, he says it's true of me. If they kill me today, I'll live eternally with him. Notice what how the tenderness of this letter in verse 9. I know your tribulation. I, I'm not devoid of knowledge of what's going on. I know that you're in poverty. These people had nothing. Many of them lost their jobs because of their allegiance to Christ. And so monetarily, physically, materially speaking, he's saying, look, I know your poverty, but you are actually very rich because you're rich in me. You're not going to lose anything. You're storing up treasures in heaven. I know what the Jews are doing. I know they're blaspheming your name. I'll tell you what I think about the Jews. I think they're the synagogue of Satan. That's the way Jesus talked about these Jews, the synagogue of Satan. They call themselves Jews, but they're not Jews. They haven't repented, they haven't believed, and they don't worship me. Then they're not a true Jew. That's what it, so I know what's going on here. Now, he, he says... But also know this, some of you are going to be tested even further. Some of you are going to be thrown into prison. Some of you are going to be really tried. tried. And he says this, Be faithful unto death. Go all the way to the point of dying and don't deny your faith. Stay strong to the very end. Seal your testimony with your own blood. Seal your confession with the loss of your own physical life. Be faithful unto death. And notice what the, the writer says, and the Lord being the writer. I will give you a crown of life. Okay, this is a point that I've got to wrestle with. Do I believe this letter? Now, us Americans, we can't grab the weight of it. If there's any way possible to imagine somebody coming in the door saying, deny the faith or I'm going to put you to death, and they could drag you outside of this church and hang you up on a piece of wood and burn you to death, if that is a very real and literal happening this day, are you a person that could read this letter and say, my captain says be faithful unto death, I will not deny him. Do you, do you see the, the worth of the Savior and the worth of the gospel to be that great for you? And so that's the letter, basically the gist of what he writes to this church. Now let us take a moment and look at one particular man, a man by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp lives in this time, this day, and so Polycarp, can't be proven, but more than likely, he is the bishop, the pastor, the leader of the church of Smyrna. So Polycarp receives this letter from John. Now, there's a lot of different sources you could read about Polycarp and all of these stories that are out there. I have looked into 
Smyrna wrote a letter to the church of Philomelium. And they wrote a letter of Polycarp's martyrdom to give an accurate account of what happened to Polycarp. And so that's uh, a lot of my resource comes from that letter. The church of Smyrna wanted to make his martyrdom known and to know how one is to go through martyrdom. So if I can have your attention for just a moment this morning, I want us to reflect on Polycarp, a man just like you, two legs, two arms, a person who's given his life to Christ. Let's look at him, how he's martyred, and see what we can learn from that. Okay. It is said of the martyrs of the church of Smyrna, and most specifically we'll move to Polycarp, but I want you to hear what they said about the martyrs. There were others besides Polycarp. But listen to what they said. Who can fail to admire their nobleness of mind, their patience, with great love towards their Lord, which they displayed? So watching the martyrs go into the stadium to be killed, they learned of their love for the Lord, their nobleness, and their patience. When they were torn with scourges, that the frame of their bodies, even to the very inward veins and arteries, was laid open, they were noble, patient, and exhibited love towards the Lord. They even endured while those that stood by pitied and bewailed them, calling them things like, you know, showing how stupid and irrelevant it would be to do what they're doing and claim allegiance to Christ. The way they responded to that was astounding. The fire of the savage executioners seemed to cool them. They kept before them that fire which is eternal and never shall be quenched. They look forward to the place where good things are laid up for those who endure. They're being burnt at the stake, looking to where things are stored up that can't be burnt. You know any Christians like that? Christians that would take the heat of being burned at the stake, but have cast their eyes into eternity and find that their faith in those things outweighs the present burning. Even though they were condemned to the wild beast, endured dreadful tortures, stretched out on open beds full of spikes, subjected to various other kinds of torments, even though they were subjected to all that to lead them to deny Christ, we find that their characters were noble, patient, and great love towards their Lord. I hope this is affecting your American mindset because in America, we get all worked up over trivial little things. Just get under our skin and we lose it. And here are people being burnt, being tortured, being stretched out, and the thing that is coming out of them is nobleness, patience, and love for the Lord. And it's having an effect upon those who are watching. You're watching a man go to his death point while he's singing, while he's praying, while he's worshiping, and somehow you're thinking... What does he have because I don't have it? It's having that kind of effect. Well, during this process of martyrdom, the crowd and the people began to demand the execution of Polycarp. After Germanicus uh, was martyred, uh, you know, they brought out the wild beast for Germanicus. You know what he did? He taunted the wild beast where they would hurry up where he could go home faster. So, come on, eat me now. And they did. And they, they destroyed him, but he got to go home sooner. And after that execution of Germanicus, uh, they began to cheer, away with the atheist, let Polycarp be set out, searched out. Let us find Polycarp because he is the leader to this spurious cult. Let us kill him where we can put this thing to rest. So all the crowd began to call for the execution of Polycarp. Three days before Polycarp was to be executed, he was praying, and he had a vision that his pillow was on fire. And he come to understand from that that it meant that he was to be burnt at the stake. So he broke off his prayers. He went before those who were gathered with him, and he says, the Lord has shown me something. I must be burnt alive. So not much longer after he saw this vision, 
There was a young man who was a follower of Polycarp, and under great threats of persecution at his own life, he sold out Polycarp and gave him to the hands of the betrayers. And so Polycarp is found. Now get this. You've run away. You're hiding in secrecy because of your Christianity. You're the leader of the church of Smyrna. One of your young disciples has sold you out, and this band of evil warriors comes to your door to capture you, to take you, and to either burn you at the stake or turn you over to the wild beast. That's what's happening. Can, can you work with that? They, they come to your door, and you know the sole purpose is to apprehend you and to put you to death. What's your response? Well, how do you respond? What, what is your tone? What is your attitude? How, how do you speak to those who come beating on your door and are going to kill you because you follow Jesus? Polycarp. What's he say? He says, okay, I want food to be set before these men, and I want drink to be set before these men. I want them to eat all that they can eat, and I want them to drink all that they can drink. And then he asks the soldiers that come to apprehend him, he says, would you please give me one hour to pray? You eat and drink, and I'll pray. So he feeds the army that has come to arrest him while he stands and prays, and he ends up praying for two hours standing and praying while they eat and drink. The effect the soldiers begin to repent because they have come to apprehend a man that is so noble. It's astounding. Many in the group began to repent that they had come against so godly and honorable an old man. By the way, he's 86 years of age. So now he's apprehended, he's brought into the city. Here he comes, he's coming into the city. Herod and his father Nicetus, both riding in a chariot, met Polycarp, who coincidentally was riding on a donkey. And so here he comes, they meet together, and they take Polycarp off the donkey, they put him in the chariot. And they say to him, What harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar? What harm is there in sacrificing with the other ceremonies observed on such occasions? And so make sure of safety. Can't you just go along? I mean, what's the big deal? Just say Caesar is Lord and you'll be safe. I mean, it's not that hard. You can worship your God on your own time and just acknowledge Caesar, Caesar is Lord. And can't we just all get along? Maybe here in the chariot we could sing Kumbaya and it'll all be nice. Polycarp says not a word for a while. And then finally, he responds. And this is what he says. I shall not do as you advise me. So they threw him out of the wagon. They threw him out. He's 86 years old. They threw him out of the wagon. When he hits, he dislocates his hip. So his hip's dislocated. He's 86 years old. He gets up, and he directs his course, and he walks towards the city and towards his execution with a dislocated hip. Without complaint, he went forward with all haste and was conducted to the stadium where the tumult was so great, there was no possibility of being heard. They were all in such a ruckus and cheering for the execution of Polycarp. You couldn't even hardly hear any distinct voice. But in the middle, as he's brought in, there is a voice that comes from somewhere in the midst of that stadium. And this is what they say the voice said. Be strong and show thyself a man, O Polycarp. Play the man in the midst of your persecution here. So when they bring him into the stadium, the leaders sought to get Polycarp to repent of his Christianity. And they said to Polycarp, what we want you to say is we want you to declare away with the atheist, meaning away with Christians. But Polycarp, refusing to play the game, points and looks at the stadium full of the crowd. And he looks at all them. He says, away with the atheist. And he calls the whole crowd atheist. So this dialogue begins in that regard. The proconsul says, swear and I will set thee at liberty. Reproach Christ. Polycarp says this. Most famous statement you've ever heard from Polycarp. This is his response. Eighty and six years I have served him, and he never did me any injury, 
How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? The proconsul says, swear by the fortune of Caesar. Polycarp says, since thou art vainly urgent that, as thou sayest, I should swear by the fortune of Caesar, and pretendest not to know who and what I am, hear me declare with boldness. Can you see him there in the stadium? Hear me declare with boldness. I am a Christian. That's his confession before the whole world that is seeking to put him to death. I am a Christian. Don't misunderstand this. I am a Christian. What does that mean? I follow Christ no matter what the cost. By the way, they, he asked and pleaded with the leaders that he could give an account or defense of his faith and his doctrine, and they denied it to him and said, you try to persuade the crowd. And he said, they're not worthy of an account for me, and he would give them no account. So the threat goes on. The proconsul says, I have wild beasts at hand. Repent of your faith in Christ. Polycarp says, call them, for we are not accustomed to repent of what is good in order to adopt that which is evil. The proconsul says, I will cause thee to be consumed by fire if you do not repent from your belief in Christ. Polycarp says this, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and after a little is extinguished. But you're ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why tarriest thou? Bring forth the fire. Polycarp is then sentenced to be burned. While the proconsul spoke many things to persuade Polycarp, Polycarp was filled with confidence and joy. Now pause here. Let me get this straight. Wild beast, fire, ridicule, scorning, mocking, all of these things are coming. And at that moment, when all that's coming on Polycarp, his level of joy is rising. Do we know anything about Christianity? Do we know anything about a gospel like this? That as all the heat of persecution comes, joy rises and a sense of worship and praise to God. That's what's going on with Polycarp. The heathen and the Jews of Smyrna cried out with uncontrollable fury in a loud voice, quote, This is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, and the overthrower of our gods. He who has been teaching many not to sacrifice or to worship the gods. And they demanded he be destroyed with wild beasts. Philip the Asiarch would not do that, so they cried out in one consent, Polycarp, should be burnt alive. Fitting. Think about the wickedness of these people. So they decide, let's burn him. You know, the people left the stadium. You know what they did? They ran out to the shops and the businesses around town, grabbed desks and legs off chairs and broke, you know, broke chairs and got the wood where they could hurry back and get the wood fast enough where they could see this man burned to death. And they stack up all the wood around, and, and they're ready to, to light the fire and put polycarp there and light this fire. So Polycarp takes off his outer garment. He takes off his little sport coat, if you will. And so he's ready to go. And they're about to fix his body to the wood by nails. We'll have to nail him to the wood in order that he won't flee from the fire. You know what Polycarp said? He said, don't do that. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Leave me as I am. For the one who gives me strength to endure the fire will also enable me, without your securing me by nails, to remain without moving in the midst of the pile. Forget your nails. He who enables me to stand will enable me to stand. I will not run. I'll stand in the fire and let it burn. But I am not repenting of my faith in Christ. So they did not nail him to the wood. I did not record his prayer because it is very lengthy. But I will say this to you about... Once he's there in the wood, he did pray. His prayer was addressed to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And while he's in the wood waiting for it to be lit, the content or the meat of his prayer is him giving thanks to God that he was worthy to be a mar martyr of such a great God. He prays that he will be considered a rich and acceptable sacrifice to the God of heaven. He concludes his prayer with praise blessing God and seeking to give God the glory that God is due. 
fascinating. You may or may not have heard this. They start the fire, and it blazes up. It goes forth in great fury, they said, but a miracle occurred by the eyewitnesses. According to the eyewitnesses, they said, quote, the fire shaped itself into a form of an ark, like the sail of a ship when filled with the wind, encompassed by, uh, as by a circle around the body of the martyr. He appeared in the flame as bread in an oven that is heated but not burnt. Here's the fire burning, but Polycarp is not being burnt. They said they even reported they smelled the fragrance as if sweet frankincense or some other spice was smoking there. So they ordered Polycarp to be stabbed because the fire was not working. The soldier pulled out the dagger, stabbed him in the left side, the blood came forth, and put out the fire. And there Polycarp died. All the people wondered that there should be such a difference between the unbelievers and the elect. They would not give the body of Polycarp to the Christians. They just laid his body back on the wood and restarted the fire and burning. Christians later gathered his bones and put them in a good place and gathered, gathered around the bones of Polycarp in joy and rejoicing in the Lord as they celebrated a life of worthiness. He is reported to be the twelfth martyr of the church of Smyrna. Now, that's the account. And let's go through it just one more time really briefly. This is the best. I've weeded out what I think has been added and things I've done the best I can to give you an accurate account to the best of my ability, the life of Polycarp. Now, knowing that's what Polycarp went through, before he went through that, he read this letter. He probably read this letter to his church. Now think about it. This is what he read. I know your tribulation. I know your worldly poverty, but you're spiritually rich. I know the Jews are blaspheming your name. I know these Jews are of the synagogue of Satan. Polycarp, do not fear what you are about to suffer. The devil's going to throw you in prison. You're going to be tested. You're going to experience tribulation. Polycarp, be faithful unto death. Polycarp, if you'll be faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. Please listen, church. He read this book, this letter, and he said, I believe it. Not only did he say, I believe it, he demonstrated his belief by his action, by his countenance, by the way he handled the whole situation. This is real Christianity, believing what God has said in his word. Polycarp believed the word of God, Polycarp obeyed the word of God, and he was rewarded by the God of the Word. And I know it's a simple application, if you will, but let me at least say it out loud. Do you believe the Word of God? Do you obey the Word of God? Will you be rewarded in regard to your faithfulness to this great Savior? Now lastly, and it's just point number four, what is learned, it's a simple setting forth here, what is learned of the gospel? So if you can hang in five more minutes or less, what is learned of the gospel? Let me start with saying this about God. I want you to hear this. What is revealed here by the life of Polycarp about God is God's worth. His worth. Do you know people do really weird things for something they consider worth the expense? You know, you could... There's all kinds of crazy things that people do because they think it's worth it to obtain something. People will work an insane amount of hours, always be gone. You know why they'll work an insane amount of hours, drive an insane amount of distances, sacrifice an insane amount of time away from their wife and kids? You know why? Because they think money's worth it. 
They think material things is worth it. You think, or you think a relationship is worth it. I remember driving 32 hours straight just to get back home in order that I could be with my family because I thought my family was worth a 32-hour drive without stopping. I remember the other night, my son-in-law, Joel, he loves Samantha, and Samantha was here. Y'all remember when she was here? Joel preaches Sunday night in southern Illinois, and after he gets through preaching Sunday night, he gets in the car, he drove all night, get here at 6 in the morning because he thought it was worth it to see Samantha. People do crazy things for something they think has worth to it. There are people, anyways, what kind of worth does God have to you? Is he worth? What is he worth? Time? Money? Sacrifice? Study? Is he worth your life? I can tell you about Polycarp. I can tell you about other martyrs. But what we're pressing here is, I want to know, what about you? What, what type of worth does God have to you? You can learn from Polycarp's story that God is faithful. And you can learn that in this extreme story, God is sufficient how do you stand in a pile of wood and say, don't nail me, I can stand here and pray and sing and have joy? How can you do that unless God is sufficient to see you through such a situation? What Polycarp is showing us here today is the sufficiency of God is far greater than you ever imagined. What else is learned? I want to say a couple of things about the church. You may not uh, like the phrases, but persecution is a blessing persecution purifies the church persecution persecution drives out goats and reveals who sheep are as first corinthians 11 says there must needs be factions among you in order that that which is genuine may be made known and so persecution actually helps purify a church it's a blessing it's a great purifier persecution is a refining fire we could list all kinds of things, but I can tell you right now, the great problem with the American church is, is that she's been coddled way too long by a bunch of entertainment, man-centered, driven ideologies. You want a church that's really a church, she's going to have to go through a little bit of heat and a little bit of pressure in order that all those other things can be driven out, in order that people can learn how to have faith and hope and love and grow and understand the truth and the beauty of the gospel and actually worship the living God and see Him as the most valuable thing that has ever been. What is learned about the gospel that Polycarp believed? I think it's the same gospel that we have today. And I think these are some things that can be learned. The gospel is enough. It's enough for a man to turn from the world, from his self, to trust Christ alone for all of eternity is enough. To be forgiven of sins, to have his righteousness imputed unto us, is enough. We can be satisfied with the gospel. The gospel reveals a necessity of faithfulness. This gospel is worthy of being faithful to. It enables us to receive the crown of life. And maybe one of the greatest blessings of the gospel you can find in this letter is in the last line in verse 11. This one who conquers. The gospel saves us from hurt by the second death. You don't have to worry about that. Because in Christ, there is life forevermore. It is without doubt that the modern gospel of the American church is extremely weak in comparison to the saints of old. Uh, Y'all know I read probably more than I need to read. But nevertheless, what I read in the Word of God, like this type of story, or I read the life of Polycarp, or I read others, I'm not seeing that in our day and age. I, where are the people who have this kind of commitment? Where are people who are so radically changed by the gospel that God becomes the primary one of the entirety of their lives? I, I want to see a gospel that outshines everything that the world has to offer. Where is a gospel that delivers men from the world and causes them to fall zealously in love with Christ? 
when the lives of men and women in the Bible are read and understood, it is for sure that their view of God and the gospel is superior to ours. It causes one, even me, to blush to read of the lives of the Christian martyrs and at the same time be aware of what causes us in our day to compromise. A blush at what I've compromised over in my life, over the pressures I felt. And then I read Polycarp and I'm like, I've never even felt the pressure. I pray that as we seek a right view of the book of Revelation, that it will strengthen our faith and that we will have a high view of Christ, a high view of His Word, and that we will live in the reality that our King is reigning in and through His church. Think of this. If you want to put it maybe in a modernized version, if you will, what if next week, think about it, next week comes out from President Barack Obama in the White House, and pushed out through America. Either deny faith in Christ or pay a $50,000 fine. What you going to do? Deny your faith in Christ or you get a fine of $50,000. You don't pay it, you're going to jail. What you going to do? How much is God worth? How much is the gospel worth? How much is he worth? Would you sell him out for 50000 What would you sell him out for? Are you going to stand and say, do what you will. I've served him for 86 years. He's never done me no wrong. I should not do him any wrong now. What type of response do we have when persecution comes? Therein you will find what your true belief of the gospel is. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the life of Polycarp. I thank you for what he has taught me. Thank you for what he has taught us this day. But Lord, more importantly, I thank you for the Lord Jesus who would not compromise no matter to what level of pressure, even to absorb the fullness of the wrath of God. He would drink to the last drop in order to redeem and secure for himself a bride. We praise you and thank you for the Lord Jesus. May we value Him, may we honor Him, may we worship Him, may we love Him with everything we have. And Father, we pray that as different persecutions and different things come upon our life, different afflictions, that it will cause our faith to increase, it will cause our hope to increase, it will cause our love to increase, and we will find that the things on the other side have gained greater value than anything this world has to offer. And Father, lastly this morning, I pray for those in this very room who have not repented and they've not believed in Christ. I pray that somehow, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you can show them the worth of Christ. They can see the worth of Christ. They can see the beauty of Christ, the glory of Christ. They can see his substitution on the cross. They can see his resurrection from the dead. They can see him reigning in power and authority at the right hand of God in heaven. They can see the glory of Christ, and they would turn from the things of this world and say, I give my life to Christ. No matter what comes, let it come. I give my life to Christ. So help me, God, here I stand. Help some to be brought to life and to become worshipers of the living God. We pray these things this day by your Spirit in Christ's name. And God's people said,